what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do For fuck's sake, for fuck's sake The world's gone mad and I'm sharing it with you For fuck's sake, for fuck's sake So sit right down, grab a glass of wine Maybe a cup of tea and some chocolates And, and join me for another, for fuck's sake Hello and welcome. Excuse me, I'm just pointing at Larry. Can you see him? Can you see him? Yeah. Look at him back there. Oh, my God. Uh, to today's, for fuck's sake, like I said in last week's episode with Leland Sklar, how amazing was that? I can't, I mean, really, it's just, the man is incredible. And also very rude, as you saw with the bread. Uh, but today is a very, very different, for fuck's sake, uh, because... I am about to begin a four-parter. It's like a mini-series, isn't it? It's a mini-documentary series, Matt. Um, and it is basically a conversation over four parts, over four weeks, with a fabulous man, my friend um, from Britain. Both ended up in New Orleans. I'm not going to give too much away, but basically he has made New Orleans his own. He's become pretty much the piano player of that style, of that tradition, of the New Orleans style. Um, he kind of owns it and more. And truly, I had a feeling that if I scratched away enough, I would find some amazing stories. And in fact, I really, really did. So what began as a, what I said to him was going to be a one-hour conversation turned into a four. Um, and we ended up with four episodes. The man I'm talking about is Grammy-winning, just what a unique man, Mr. John Cleary. So... Here is episode one. How the fuck did he get there, for fuck's sake? How did it happen? How did either of us get there? But more importantly, how did he get there? Join me, please, for what I know will be quite an entertaining half an hour with somebody I'm so proud to call my friend. This is my conversation with John Cleary. Pick out your steamboat, babe. Pick yourself a train. A slow train. Pick out your steamboat, baby, now. Pick yourself a train. They made you close up and they'll never let you back they won't let you back go buy your ticket mama else you gonna walk the track no use complaining land blue sky following the cold No use complaining, blue skies follow rain. Just if it will not end, go get your one last thrill. Your one last thrill. Just if it will not Farewell to Stowe. You do make that piano sound good. <laughs> you know you This do. piano makes this piano sound good. This piano good. actually makes its own gravy. I think this yeah, piano it makes does. its own gravy. I'm just going to say right now and just kick off and say... I am joined today. It is, it is the dream come true. I'm joined today in the great room by the fantastic Mr. John Cleary. Thank you very much. I don't have Thank my applause much. machine, but we don't need it because we're too real for me to use that cheap, cheap applause machine that we love so much. Now, <laughs> I like I, cheap applause. Though. I do love cheap applause. It's the best kind of applause there is, is the cheap applause. It's astonishing to be sat here in New Orleans um, with not only a fellow Brit, 
but one of the reasons I wanted to ask to, or to talk with you and to, and to ask you these questions, like, <laughs> look at me, I'm, I'm like real interviewer, serious interviewer here, you see me. Um, but the reason I wanted to do this is because what are the fucking chances, for fuck's sake, that a man from Kent, a Kentish man, um, and a woman who, from Wales originally, but when my family left London, went to live in Kent. What, how many stops down the road, right, down I the track? I think it Orpington, Orpington. Marden, Pluckley, Staples, Ashford. You can't remember that. I can't remember them When you were a kid. Oh yeah, you're about, you're about four stops up the line, aren't you, on the train from where I grew up. It, Tunbridge, four Tunbridge, Wells, away. you know. I mean, it's, this is like in, in our DNA at this point. What are the chances? That I, you know, I would end up meeting you here in your yeah. limbs. That's like David Attenborough, here in your limbs, on the edge of the French <laughs> Quarter. It, that, what are the chances that it would be, you know, two two people who know Kent very well? You're an absolute Kentish man, as it were, uh, but would end up here, so in love with this place, so drawn to this place. And I've wanted for the longest time um, to ask you these questions that I have amassed here in a very informal way but usually I'm so full of like laughter either I'm watching you and enjoying what you're doing so much because I'm such a humongous fan it's so shocking I adore you so much musically and otherwise or if we are together in any other way and we have traveled the world together it's turned out but we're usually laughing so, and being so badly behaved in a kind of British offensive carry-on way because everything <laughs> sounds so funny <laughs> <laughs> I know. But, yeah. You know, a lot, an awful lot of what I've wanted to ask you has gone unsaid. So today, I get to ask these questions for my fabulous fans of For Fuck's Sake. For Fuck's Sake, mm. it is John Cleary. I want to ask you the most important question. First of all, what, what, was the, what set you off, your love affair with New Orleans? How, who was the biggest influence on your young life musically? Um, well, it was all sort of direct and indirect, really. Um, my dad and my mum. Yeah. Um, largely because my mum had a passion for New Orleans jazz. She was that generation in the 50s yeah. that was going out to see Chris Barber and Ken Collier. Um, you know, the English trad guys. And she loved that stuff. She was always around jazz musicians and jazz music. Um, and my dad was into the skiffle thing. He, was, he had a skiffle band. But my dad, when he was courting my mum, would teach my mother's younger brother, who was left in the room almost as a sort of a chaperone. <laughs> thing, Those to were stop the days. Any, yeah. Stop any hanky-panky. Yes, yeah. and so my dad discovered that if he taught him a new chord of the guitar, the... the um, the younger brother would then disappear upstairs and start to spend hours practicing it. And he, my uncle John, ended up moving to New Orleans. So my dad taught John to play music. Wow. My mum's younger brother. And he ended up living in New Orleans, becoming a musician and a painter and an all-round raconteur and character. And um, when he came back from New Orleans after several years in the early 70s when I was still at school, it was a very exciting thing. And he came back with stories that just lit my head up. I'd already, and I started playing. I'd already started playing because everyone in my family played, so it was just a natural thing to do. But the New Orleans thing came from, uh, from John, really. But so, originally from my mum. But that is thrilling. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I mean, I relate yeah. thoroughly to this because it's my mum and dad. I get, you know, this is... The, yeah. Oh, yeah, my it's dad was... a family was, affair. Yeah, it's a family affair. My mother yeah. was into jazz and big band. <clears> and my dad was absolutely piano, nut, crazy, Jelly Roll Morton, Albert Ammons, all these yeah. people. At, I mean, which is so... It yeah. comes early from that place. But I hadn't realised... I've heard, I know I'd heard you saying it before about your uncle... But I didn't realize that he'd come here first. Yeah, he came and lived here in the late 60s or the early 70s, oh early 70s. God. He was traveling, so he delivered a car here and just stayed. And um, stayed for a couple of years. And then he went from here to Shirkin Island off the coast, of, off the coast of Ireland and lived there. Before what a did, shock. Before eventually showing up out of the blue in England. And he traveled. He still does travel a lot, but those days he would disappear from sort of say it was popping out and he'd turn up two years later and we'd find out, you know, he'd been some exotic place. One time I asked my mum, I said, where, where is Uncle John? And she said, um, 
I think he's living in a cave in the Sahara Desert, darling. Oh, <laughs> well, we'll and get, he was. And he probably he was, was isn't in he? Mauritania yeah. living in a cave in the desert, in the Sahara Desert. So he was just an exotic character that sort of flitted in and out of our lives, very colourful. Um, the stories about New Orleans were great. You know, he used to drink at Johnny Matassa's bar, which is just around the corner. You know where Matassa's yeah. grocery is? Well, there yeah. used to be a bar room in the back. Wow. It was Cosmo Matassa's father. Yeah. And he used to drink in that The infamous bar. Matassas. Yeah. yeah. Johnny Matassas. So I grew up with stories about Professor Longhair and Matassas Lounge and uh, anecdotes about carnival. It's and, uh, so yeah. it, it really did fill you with, it whetted your appetite. Yeah, completely. yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard Burgundy Street, tuned Burgundy Street Blues when I was very little and now I live on Burgundy Street. Oh my, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the first thing? Can you, can you remember the first thing that you heard that really like hit? hit you as far as that you remember to this day of hearing from from him or anything that that was new orleans related yeah, that he came back with or the music that you were hearing in the house or anything that you know was this related well to this i can remember the first thing was kind of actually kind of unrelated because i think aside from all this uh i feel like i was kind of hardwired for this stuff anyway like yeah. i would have got here anyway yeah but the earliest thing i can remember is what a, as a child with this being in the living room and calling for my mum to come and quick, 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 come watch this. It was on television. I was just mesmerised. It was Little Richard. And she yeah. said, oh, yeah, that's, look, there was a film I had. To, I think it was The Girl Can't Help The it. Girl it Can't a, Help It. It was Fats Domino and Little Richard. It just blew my mind and my mum. I didn't know who they were. So that's Fats Domino and Little Richard. Yeah, well, it's about as exciting as anything that, that you, I mean, that's what I was thinking. It's yeah. like being in, you know, in Britain. <laughs> Which was still, you know, yeah. a fairly gloomy place, let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, in the 70s. Post war for the longest time, 70s, yeah. I remember it well. Yeah. And it was gloomy and it was on its knees and it was still struggling. And to see these things, I recall, you know, hearing this stuff, seeing it, even though it was from a different time, but seeing this, this from America, so thrilling. So thrilling. Yeah, very exotic. I remember getting a postcard from New Orleans that actually had a ball of cotton, a cotton ball attached to it. And, um, and uh, on the front was the Preservation Hall with the band, with the famous oh old postcard with the Saints. Or, you know, um, request one dollar, the Saints, five dollars. <laughs> you know that the famous <laughs> image of the Preservation Hall? Yeah, that and is And then when amazing. he came back, he came back with, a, with two suitcases full of records. And I would go and stay with him. And I got this amazing education in New Orleans rhythm and blues. And my ears were wide open. I was about yeah. 11, 12 years old. And so, um, and so my mum recently found one of my old school books, the first day of school, What Do You Want to Be When You Grow Up? And I said, I want to be a session musician in New Orleans, but my dad won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. He did. But he did. Bless him, he, he did, relented. yeah. They so, let me go, so I came here, yeah, I came here with $100 40 years ago, expecting to stay for two weeks, that was the idea, and I'm still here. I never went back. So uh, I think if my mum knew at the time I wasn't coming home, she wouldn't have let me go. Of course she wouldn't. Mums <laughs> don't want to lose their sons. No, no way they don't. Was it piano first or guitar first? What was it? Guitar. Yeah, so played... You were like, like, do, like Dr. John. It was just guitar. Yeah, was I played guitar. guitar for years. I started, I was quite precocious. I started playing really little when I was really little. And my dad, my, my hands weren't big enough to go around the, the neck of his. My dad's guitar it was huge, bigger than I was. So he got me a small scale, little Spanish guitar with nylon strings which were impossible to bend and I wanted to bend the strings that's what, what I was really into and so I would but my finger the skin would peel the skin oh my off God. my fingers and I'd be yeah. bleeding but I took this guitar everywhere with everywhere I went I took it to bed took it to walk to school with it it was just a constant companion because you know it was the, the when you're young the mystery the, my, the magical mystery box that is music it's, it's, if it's presented to you in the right way and you get an in it just takes over. And everything. you're left to your own devices. I think that's one of the yeah. big keys is that you're left to dis in, in this world of, of possibility yeah. to discover it for yourself. Yes. And that's thrilling. I could get, you know, I got some, I got some little tips here and there. Like one of the first things I learned was that riff from Honky Tonk. Yeah. Yeah. John, John showed me that and my dad showed me some basic chords. And then I figured it out, basically. I figured it out because it's a very logic when you go into, if, you're, if you have the time and nothing else to do, there was no, there were no computer games, no internet. 
I'm in the countryside, yeah. there's nothing going on, yeah. miles away from all your friends, mm -hmm. surrounded by fields. Um, so that's what I did. I played records and just tried to figure stuff out. And when I figured out the cycle of fifths or fourths, depending on which way you look at it, I thought like I'm like, you know, yeah. flashes of light going yeah. off, yeah. major revelation. I ran out to the yard and said, Dad, look, if I play E and then play A, and then that means you go to D and then G and then C and then, and then you go and you come back to E. <laughs> I just admit, up to that point, I just thought they were an infinite number of chords, and you know. Uh -huh. But you figure, you start figuring out the mathematical logic yeah. of music, and um, and it just keeps feeding you vital information. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that was the guitar, and then. Um, so when 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 the piano, I'm I'm fascinated well, by how that. Well, the piano. We had along. a piano in the house. And there's a story behind that too, because it belonged to my grandmother. I mean, really, I suppose. Uh, the music comes from further back than that. My, three of my grandparents were, were involved with music. Um, on my mum's side, my great granddad was a singer and a tap dancer with a top hat and a cane. And his stage name was Frank Neville, the little fellow with the educated feet. No, you see, that's, I knew yeah. this would be good. I knew it would be good. I, these are I, mean, I had no idea. This is what I yeah. thought. If I scratch away really here, I'm going to find some. Apparently, I know, he died before I could ever see him perform. He was a really good entertainer. Fa Frank singer. Neville and the educated... The, Frank Neville, the little fellow with little the educated fellow. feet. It's fantastic. And then my grandmother, her stage name was Sweet Dolly Daydream. Singer? Yeah, she sang. She had a lovely voice. Um, this is music hall now we're talking, isn't this it? This is post-music hall, really, post, around yeah. the war years. Okay. You know, 30s um, into the war years. Um, and then on my dad's side, his dad um, was taught to play drums and piano when he was young. Uh, um, but my grandmother, unfortunately, suffered, had a terrible accident. Her arm was cut off in an industrial accident at the age of 16. And with the compensation money that she was given, she bought a piano, which took up one. They lived in two rooms in West London, just off of Westbourne Park. And the piano took up half of one of the rooms. But for her, that was the most important thing. She couldn't play it. She only had one hand. She just had her arm chopped off. But she spent all the money on the well, spent half, half the money went to looking after the family because they were poor, but the yeah. other half was her suspended. She bought the piano and it's still now, now in our living room at home and it's been oh at our gosh. it's been the center of all our family parties for the last 70 or 80 years probably. That's an amazing story. Yes. Yeah, so and, and I guess she took her pleasure was in seeing people hearing people playing. Well she gave it to my mum and dad after they got married. And um, yes and I think she was very I think it touched her deeply that I that I ended up becoming a piano player. That's I'm sure I, it did. Yeah. So it is in the DNA. I always say this. I yeah. believe it is. It's always a matter of nature or nurture. And, and I know. I often ask musicians here, you know, I'm always curious to know about the history and if they had musicians in their family, and often they do, and sometimes really famous musicians. And often you'll find they don't. They'll be yeah. the only person. None of them, it just came from nowhere. And they're yeah. good players too. Yeah. So I don't know, nature or nurture has always been a bit of a mystery to me. But it's true. I think it's, true. Uh, it's good if you have a bit of both. But now you have, obviously, I might say obviously, but you have Irish roots. Yes, right? yeah, on both sides. Yeah. Pretty big. So yeah. do you think that plays a part in it? Because I happen to think it does, personally. I'm well, very I think it does. I'd like to think that As it does. As a Celt, does. I feel that way. Cleary is one of the oldest Irish names. And it comes from Cleric. And the Clerics were the ones that were, 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 were um, tasked with writing the poems and the songs and the history. And so I would like to think it's a nice romantic notion that some of that is in my Celtic DNA from generations past. Yeah. Uh, as I said, it's a little flight of romantic fancy, but. You're allowed. Yeah. I mean, it's, I believe when you're Irish, you're allowed to have yeah. many a flight of fancy or, yeah. you know, much more than the Welsh. We're too, we're, we're too depressed. But I just, I, do, I think that that's what you get to do. But I, yeah, I think it all, it all makes tremendous sense at the end of the day but it it's the love affair with the piano did you have a moment where you thought no this is it now i mean the guitar i can put to the side a little bit but now that i found my instrument did you have that well you know i, I would always go through i like my uncle's record collection was incredible i had three uncles who were musicians wow 
So I spent time with them. My uncle Bruce had them made. He, he, you know, go through his record collection. It was incredible. Clifton Chenier and then Brazilian music and gospel quartets and traditional music, all sorts of amazing stuff. So I had access to all this stuff, but they actually lived quite a long way away. We lived down the way down in Kent. They were up in North London. Yeah. So uh, when we go and visit, I would go straight to the record collections and see what I could find. And when they would come and visit, they'd always bring records with them. And so, um, and they all dug diff slightly different things. So from each of them, I got all sorts of great stuff. My auntie Heather would come down in the 70s with a, she had a big afro and hot pants and platform shoes. And she'd show up with Donny Hathaway and Staple <laughs> Singers oh, records. Gosh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was the soul department. And then Uncle John was sort of the rock and roll kind of R&B department. My mum was New Orleans jazz and my dad was into the skiffle and lead belly and that kind of the more raw it's stuff. a family thing isn't it it really yeah. I, I think it is you see i mean i, yeah, I just really think is. the things that you get influenced by it's not just one thing it's not what one person brings mm. it's when you have a combined front you know it's yeah. like takes a village and they're all bringing these you know, say talk about donny hathaway i know you and i have a you know you're the only person i've ever met who said johnny guitar watson and my eyes lit up because <laughs> it's not that usual to, no. to hear that and well, to no, know it's, no, it's very unusual to have access to all that stuff yeah and um, but that was just the family so when i was at school Everyone else was listening to Gary Glitter and oh. Bay City Rollers. Isn't it? And Listen. that was Top of the Pops. You know, we uh -huh. all talk about what was on Top of the Pops. And, you know, you want to be with all your mates. I hated that stuff. But when punk came out, I thought that was really exciting. I was about yeah, 14. Me too. Me too. So I'd go and see The Clash and The Stranglers and The Damned and all those bands with my mates. And we'd all, the age of, not old enough to drink, but we'd find a way of getting into a pub. And <laughs> we'd invariably miss the bus and wake up on the beach with a hangover. And so, um, there was that was like the re the stuff I would have had access to if it hadn't been for my family. Yeah. But uh, but in amongst the records, one day I came across uh, this Dr. John record, and um, and I had t two experiences. My auntie had Right Place Wrong Time, which is a soul record, funk yeah. record. Yeah. She turned me on to that, and then I found I sort of thought oh, that sounds good, and I found this other record in my grandmother's record collection my uncle had left, which was gu called Gumbo, and that was a whole different thing altogether. And that really, there was one tune, that Stagger Lee. Where goes, yeah. And I oh thought, that's God. what I like. Yeah. I like that stuff. Yeah. That I mean, do you not agree that that is one interesting human being? Don't be don't be fooled by this dog who face. Oh, he's just moved because Aretha just walked in. I was just going to do the gag about the fact that he looked so bored he was sleeping. It it really is an amazing life, an amazing story. Wait till you hear part two. It just gets better and better and better. And thank you, Matt Midlin, for incredible editing. The two of us like sourced these photographs and found it, but really. The magic is all Matt for pulling that together and making it look like such a mini documentary series. Anyway, so do jo rejoin us next Sunday for part two. It just gets better and better all the time. Talk about one interesting life. Anyway, um, you know, the one thing that I just occurs to me, Matt, as I'm watching that, is that he is so profoundly like studied and thoughtful, his love of language. Um, he, he is such a musicologist. Uh, he's such a bon vivant, he's a storyteller, but he's somebody from another time, isn't he? He's almost like Graham Greene wrapped up in Hemingway, wrapped up in something else. You know, he really is from another time. And I sound like a barking corgi next to him. I mean, really, uh, you know, just as well, because I keep, you know, I keep it going. But but I, I watch myself. I, am I being too harsh on myself, perchance? Uh, uh, yeah, barking corgi, that's me. Anyway, can't wait for you to see the next one is all I, I can say. Now, I am going to, in every one of these episodes, I, hey, i got to get some more music into it. For, 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 for fuck's sake. This is a music show as much as, uh, you know, an education about people. Uh, uh, so I am very happy to say that before we parted ways, still in New Orleans, where I interviewed John in the very same room, I did manage to do some recording with Pedro Segundo. We managed to get down some of our favorite summer songs, you know, just to grow hold tight onto summer before it disappears completely. So here is 
for your enjoyment, your delectation, Pedro Segundo, the marvelous Pedro Segundo, and myself doing a version of, well, it seems right, doesn't it? It's only 100 fucking degrees in New Orleans. It's steamy, it's sweaty, it's a zillion degrees. So isn't it right that we sing this, this song, or rather I sing this song in the company? Yes, it is. Summer in the city. I want to bid you a farewell. This is our out. I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you for spending your Sunday with me today. And John Cleary and Matt Midland, thank you so much at the helm as always. I'll see you next week. Until then, you know the drill. Masks on. Fuck anybody else for whatever they say. Look after yourselves. Look after other people. Be safe. <sighs> and I am just saying, for fuck's sake, it's tough out there. I am your hostess with the mostest love of New Orleans and John Cleary and everything that goes with that. Judith Owen saying adieu. And I love you guys. Hot town, summer in the city. The back of my neck getting dirty and gritty. Well, I've been down, isn't it a pity? There doesn't seem to be a shadow in the city Well, all around people looking half dead Walking on the sidewalks hotter than a match Help. At night it's a different world Go out, find a girl Come on, come on And dance all night despite the heat See?